wanted just to note before we, uh, you know, go too far into the conversation, we, you know, we at Seed New England, the group seeing the conversation today, but we certainly are not people of color, uh, we, but we believe the importance of this conversation and want to work together as a group in industry for change. Uh, a lot of organizations that have put out policy statements recently, we appreciate and recognize it's very absolutely necessary, but we also, as a group, recognize that the need for more than just the statements, right? So we want to find ways to work together to bring about policy and social change through leadership as planners and urbanists that we believe is so sorely needed. Uh, so uh, for tonight, our speaker, Judy Barrett, uh, will bring to light some, some policy and code issues that have racial inequality baked into them. The intent here is to find ways to take action to positively influence those communities, neighborhoods, and our society as a whole. So with that, uh, let me get, make a question uh, for Judy. Is the founding principal and managing director of Barrett Planning Group. She brings 33 years of planning and community development experience as a consultant and community and economic development professional with the state and local government at both levels. Judy has devoted her career to building the capacity of cities and towns to solve difficult public policy questions and to develop effective leadership and advocacy skills. She has prepared numerous city and town comprehensive plans, neighborhood revitalization plans, zoning ordinances and bylaws, and housing studies. She's well known for her work in affordable and fair housing policy and inclusionary zoning. She's also a frequent panelist at regional and national conferences and a guest lecturer for planning programs. Judy is also a technical assistance resource and trainer for city and town officials and nonprofit boards. So without any further ado, uh, Judy, uh, would you mind taking over the slides and uh, beginning the presentation? Thank you. Oh, you're on mute. There we go. I don't think I am anymore now. Uh, wonderful. Okay. Let us just get this going. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm not going to talk at you all that long. I want to kind of go over some few concepts and maybe lay a little bit of a framework here and then throw some questions out that I think we uh, could enjoy uh, discussing or hope to enjoy discussing. Um, so we don't have that many people on this call, so it might not be a problem if I throw something out now and if someone wants to answer, they can simply unmute. Am I right about that? If I ask a question now, can people just unmute and, and answer me? Absolutely. I think the intent here is really a discussion, so that sounds, that sounds good. So I'm just wondering if anybody recognizes the more historical pictures in this slide. Yes. Who's, what, do you, what do you recognize? Um. <laughs> Rosa Parks and uh, uh, George Floyd. Okay. Anybody recognize the others? Slave ships. The lower left is uh, is a uh, an image of a slave ship from um, the late 1600s. The colored ship that's um, ablaze there is Amistad from 1839. That was a slave revolt on a ship coming from Africa. Um, and the slide, the picture on the lower right uh, is from uh, a newspaper article when Ruby Bridges was allowed to attend school for the first day in Louisiana. And the upper right is a newspaper article that ran after the famous case Shelley v. Kramer, which in which the court held, the Supreme Court held uh, the United States that um, uh, racial covenants uh, in deeds could not be enforced by states. So. The reason I put these pictures up here is that I kind of want to get at uh, part of part of what I want to talk about a little bit later this evening is just how zoning does certain things, but there's a lot about fair housing that zoning doesn't exactly touch. So it's a big policy, a big policy question that requires us to sort of think beyond the the zoning solutions that affect the way the kinds of communities that we build and the amount of housing that we can build but it's actually even more complicated than that. So that's why I put this co collection of pictures up. So I'm gonna introduce a few um, uh, slides, some with some data, some with just some comments from, published comments from folks who, who care about this issue and follow this issue. And I, the quotes are not here because I advocate for them. They're simply to get you thinking. So when we get to the questions, uh, you might, 
kind of have a little bit of information uh, in hand. And so this first one uh, is some statistics from the Urban Institute, um, which really is trying to get people to understand the sort of systemic impact of, uh, of access to housing in, and housing opportunities for, for the black population in the United States. And the quotation is that low levels of ownership and limited access to decent affordable housing keeps black households from building wealth. Uh, I don't need to read the whole slide, but uh, and accessing good services such as schools uh, and so forth. So high achieving black families find it harder to pass on economic and educational advantages at the same rate uh, as white families. And so that the, the statistics that you see in that slide are simply comparing kind of real life earnings between uh, white population in the United States, uh, blacks and, and Latino. And as you can probably see, uh, in terms of um, the uh, of men, black men uh, have the lowest uh, real lifetime earnings, and among women, it's um, it's Lat Latina. So the next one is from Policy Link, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, Policy Link is a an advocacy and educational organization around fair housing and equal opportunity, uh, and I'll explain the picture in a minute, but. Uh, this quotation is from Angela Glover Blackwell, and what she says is, is that address um, is a proxy for opportunity, the opportunities that we have as people. So where we live determines whether we have access to good schools, decent jobs, and transportation to employment centers, which is sort of reinforcing what the previous slide said. Whether we have access to healthy living conditions, um, is the air clean? Uh, are we uh, surrounded by noise uh, and, and just air pollution from the nearby freeway or highway or the rail lines. Um, are we more likely to develop a chronic illness? And if we do, will we survive? Uh, are we more likely to be killed during a crime in a car crash or simply crossing the street? So address is a proxy for opportunity. Any serious discussion of poverty inevitably turns to the prevention and well-being, which brings us then squarely to the conversation about about the places where struggling people live. The picture on this slide um, is from Woodridge, Virginia. Um, it was sort of an expose article about opportunity zones. Um, I assume you're all familiar with opportunity zones, um, but the question that was raised in the article is, how is a wealthy census tract, uh, how does that end up qualifying for opportunity zone investments? So the, uh, clearly the, the issue in the article is just, aside from housing, now we have a federal policy that seems to be at the hands of governors of states, uh, essentially encouraging uh, tax incentive investment in wealthy areas, which was not really the intent of the program. So there's, you may have already heard about this. There's been quite a bit of discussion about it. This is just an example of kind of where that happened. I wanted to slide up here because I want people to, again, be thinking about the ways in which it, it, the problem is much more complicated than the zoning solutions that I think we all like to talk about as, as planners. Um, what do we even understand about inequity? Um, and so this is about no zones. And the, uh, the comment from the author, uh, it struck me because I know so many people who just who fit into this category of people who can name their favorite restaurants in cities around the world and feel comfortable in all kinds of cultures and spending their vacations among strangers without fear will draw a complete blank when it comes to firsthand experience in the poorest sections of their own cities. For many, the least known territories of the globe may lie right behind their doors. Um, and so this is from a, a blog, which some of you may be familiar with, it's Community Architect. Um, and it, but it's about, it's about no zones and the, 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 the lack of ability of planners and, and other professionals in the field to walk into these places and actually experience what it means to live in a poor neighborhood. So we talk about planning for them and we talk about what we think the solutions are for them, but we don't really know these places because we don't go to them. Now, I don't know who all is on the call, so this map may not be resonant for all of you, certainly, but it was quick, quick for me this morning to at least think about Eastern Massachusetts. And this is simply a, uh, a little snapshot of where we have concentra higher concentrations than the average for the metro area of, uh, of the black population. And as you can see uh, in the map, this is really from the South Shore up to, um, you know, uh, well, Saugus area, Saugus Salem area. This is kind of the, the extent of the map. And what we see is that there's essentially this north-south 
line <laughs> from Roxbury down to, Bro to Brockton, where we have the highest concentrations of blacks in Eastern Massachusetts. And as soon as you kind of fan out from those areas, it becomes this sort of lightest yellow, which is areas where generally we have less than 6% of the population as a whole uh, who are black. I'm working on a master plan right now for a community in this area where there are 85 black residents out of 23,000. So, you know, outside these, these areas of concentration, which have been areas of concentration for at least 40 years, we have, we have this, you know, otherwise tremendous whiteness. And so I zoomed in, in the inset map that's in the lower end, just so you could see, even within the Boston area, we have this one sort of swath of concentration where blacks live and it just falls apart outside that area. So, you know, I think that sometimes we have, uh, it's easy to sort of think when we're in our core or communities are right around the Boston area that we have diversity, but, but really do we? And I think that was the point of this map is just to sort of think about, do you have no zones in your own communities and have you ever been in them? And have you ever talked to anybody who lives in a no zone? Um, in a city, inequality plays itself out in stark geographic terms. So this is from uh, the journal Governing from a couple of years ago. Uh, and this planner uh, took the position that people who work in urban planning try to use every tool in our disposal to make neighborhoods better. We strive to make them healthier and equitable and attractive. But no matter what we do, and no matter how the efforts we put into better transportation and developing investments in infrastructure, we can't do the one thing that most that would most improve people's lives. And that's putting money in their pockets. So that's another perspective, again, that kind of even goes beyond the question of how much can we solve through regulatory reform to ease the, um, the supply of housing and create more housing opportunities for people to, to live in neighborhoods of choice. So those quotes are just to get you thinking because um, in a minute, I'm gonna throw some questions at you, but I wanted to make sure everybody even understands a little about the history and what the law actually says I do a lot of uh, talks on this topic, and I sometimes have to remind myself that although I live, sleep, eat, and breathe, that not everybody else does. So Mount Laurel may be a, a decision or a, a case that you're familiar with, but if not, you just should sort of know in the, in the conversation of modern fair housing, Mount, Mount Laurel is a big deal. And it's Mount Laurel Township in New Jersey where the Supreme Court held that municipal land use regulations that prevent affordable housing for the poor are inherently unconstitutional. And so all New Jersey communities were ordered to plan to provide for their regional fair share of housing. And this, this is, of course, after the Massachusetts Chapter 40B was passed, but it's all in that era. It's all in that kind of same era. And, uh, and the Mount, Mount Laurel case essentially said, you guys have to plan, you have to sort of be able to do projections as to where you're going to be in 10 or, or 15 or 20 years, and what will be your regional share of the need for lower moderate income housing and how are you going to plan for it? So it's very much kind of taking a perspective look. I put this up here because it was such a pathbreaking case and yet they're continuing to struggle in Mount Laurel. This was sort of not the a case and then it was solved and everybody went on and all of a sudden we had diverse and inclusive communities. It hasn't been that way at all. It's been an extremely rocky and difficult uh, ride, frankly, as it has been in Massachusetts even with chapter 40B. The Federal Fair Housing Act um, was, uh, it goes to, back to 1968. It was passed by Congress a week after Martin Luther King was killed. Um, the original populations protected were race, color, national origin, religion, and sex. Uh, religion and sex. Um, about 10 years later, familial status and disability were added to the law. Most states have something similar, some type of fair housing law. They're not all the same. Most state laws that do address fair housing protect more populations than this. Um, and you'll certainly find that in Massachusetts. It's, quite, it's a much more extensive protection. But this is sort of the umbrella of the Federal Fair Housing Act, which attempts to, uh, to sort of uh, you know, attach to the 14th Amendment of the, to the Constitution a way to think about how housing discrimination um, creates a sort of inherent inequality. If you are a recipient of federal funds, you have additional burdens, of course, that you have to address um, to overcome the legacy of unequal treatment. And so anybody on this call who happens to be associated with one of the cities and you're working on your consolidated plans right now, you're probably familiar with this. But, um, but when you're getting any kind of federal money, there's an additional burden that you, you are really, you have an obligation to address to remove barriers to systemic um, uh, discrimination in housing. 
many people ask me in my travels, well, how does fair the fair, Federal Fair Housing Act really address us? Because we don't get that money. So what do we really have to do? And is there really an issue with zoning? And the answer really is yes, but it's a complicated one. Um, if there is a discriminatory impact and that can be illustrated, then, there, then your zoning is at risk. Is the court going to rule against it? I'm not an attorney. I'm just telling you that there is clearly a, a, a path here over about 40 years of litigation that attempts to get at this question, can communities zone people out? That's the fundamental question. Can you, through your own kind of land use regulations, essentially control the makeup of your population? And so questions that you ask yourself when you're looking at zoning and trying to think about, is there a potential problem here, is what is sort of the disparate impact of an exclusionary zoning, zoning that doesn't allow, for example, multifamily development, um, that makes it difficult for, um, uh, for things like residential treatment centers for people with, um, uh, who are recovering from an addiction. What, what does zoning do to those populations? Regulations that prevent families with children can be unlawful. They may not be inherently unlawful, but if you look at a zoning code that says you can build all the multifamily housing you want, but but it's limited to one bedroom, you know, that's that can be a problem. Um, limiting or prohibiting treatment facilities for people who are recovering from a drug addiction, people who are in recovery are protected as, as having a disability. Zoning definitions can be problematic. The definition of a family, the definition of a boarding house or a group home can be laden with language that essentially um, reduces the ability of people to choose to live in a community because of, because of race, because of familial status, because of disability. Um, other things that can creep into this discussion are things like occupancy standards, um, you know, essentially trying to regulate the size of households that can occupy a unit through things such as um, you know, the number of bedrooms, number of people per bedroom and so forth. Constraints on the location of housing for people with disabilities, certainly things that will be familiar to many of you guys, uh, a minimum lot area that's kind of generous, um, and certainly height requirements that would make the construction of multifamily housing uh, difficult, if not impossible. And of course, my favorite one of all, which is parking. Um, and par parking is one of the, the, the most, you know, <laughs> seemingly uh, non-discriminatory, but, but in terms of things that have an effect on the ability to address the needs of of housing in, in communities is one of the most damaging. And that's why we have lots of empty parking lots everywhere. Moratoria are another problem um, in communities where uh, the effect of the moratorium could have uh, an adverse impact on people of color and other populations that are protected under the Federal Fair Housing Act. Um, there was a case in New, in, uh, New Orleans after Katrina where a parish outside New Orleans wanted to sort of limit rental to, non, to limit the ability to rent units to non-family members. And the record of the adoption of this law was just replete with, with quotations and comments about a place becoming a ghetto or because it was going to be crime infested. These fears that people had as they advocated for the passage of this law, well, needless to say, it was, uh, it was appealed. And the federal district court found that the moratorium was unlawful because of the motivation behind it. Uh, and so the court invalidated that, um, that law. So land use codes can bum up against Federal Fair Housing Act, even though people often think Federal Fair Housing is just about realtors dis discriminating and showing whether they're going to show people a house or whether a landlord's trying to discriminate. It's a much more complicated conversation, and it can directly relate to the um, the regulatory, regulatory efforts of communities. Uh, we have a debate going on right now in the Boston area in Framingham about imposing a moratorium on apartments. Um, and it's a kind of loaded conversation. So uh, it's, it's not just in New Orleans where these things happen. It's really happening in our own, if you will, geographic backyard. So I have questions I thought might be useful to have a bit of a discussion about with you folks um, and, and not to sort of you know, suggest that you sh should adopt any of the quotations that were in the previous slides, but just to get you thinking about the, what this conversation is like uh, among communities, among people who are, who are advocates for affordable and fair housing or people who are trying to work on, on reducing systemic um, uh, inequality and barriers to, uh, to inclusion. So these are the questions that I kind of wanted to throw out. And the first one is, you know, affordable and fair housing, 
people often think they're one and the same and they're not. So, you know, how, how, do, we, um, how do we think about fair and how do we get something that's fair when you have these other kinds of policies like local preference? And for those of you who don't know what that means, uh, it's a practice where a community that is creating affordable housing, um, right, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a friendly or not friendly way, will say, well, we want to keep most of those units for the people who already live here because we already have people who are here. So, so when you say you want to have a local preference policy, that may not, in fact, be part of your zoning. It often is, but it can be kind of a side policy. How does that relate to fair housing and the ability of a community to, to be inclusive, to, to allow mobility? Um, and how important are some of these policies to the ability of a town to continue to create affordability? You know, how much can zoning actually accomplish to advance housing for um, housing for equity and inclusion? How do we make equity happen without stronger regional planning and an enforceable regional policy? What about home rule? Now, again, I don't know who all is on this call, so you may not all be from home rule states, but I sure am. And it's, um, it's difficult. Um, and so it's a real rub in Massachusetts in particular about uh, communities having tremendous latitude to adopt their own zoning policies and regional planning is a very, uh, it's helpful, but it doesn't have any real teeth. So how do you really deal with this problem of, of exclusionary zoning and exclusionary communities when the fact is that regulation of, of, of housing stops at the municipal line? Um, and that at best through regional planning, we can encourage conversations, but not necessarily make communities do things. I, I will tell you confessionally, I find in Massachusetts anyway, the, the falling back on home rule is sort of the reason why the state and, and regional planning can't do much is a bit of baloney because New Jersey is also a home rule state. Um, and believe me, everybody in New Jersey is subject to Mount Laurel, as complicated as that has been. Um, communities in New, New Jersey have to have a comprehensive plan and they have to have zoning that's consistent with it and that's a home rule state. So I think that there's a bigger discussion in some of our home rule states about, well, what does that really mean and where can a state or regional entity kind of assert a regional interest that transcends that local, that local concern? Um, what do you think makes an opportunity community or neighborhood? Um, and then do urbanists kind of understand their place in this conversation about housing uh, for equity and inclusion and what do urbanists care about and how can urbanists help to move uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the needle more toward more equitable communities. So those are the questions I kind of wanted to throw out to discuss. I'm not going to call on one at a time because I, I think I'm more interested to hear what people want to, which ones people are interested in. But those to me are important questions that we should be talking about. Great. Thank you, Judy. I, 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 can I, can I just ask a question? I'm not a planner. Um, and you know, I've I've been through the uh, the rezoning process in Massachusetts, and it's uh, fun, isn't it? In a town uh, to build a multifamily project recently, and um, and can you can you and and the local preference thing was a piece of the co the conversation. There was a lot of pushback on having too many two bedrooms. Uh, even two bedrooms were a, a real. Uh, challenge because the, the idea was that there's school children there's a lot of things that were said but um, I'm curious about can you maybe elaborate a little bit more what home rule means specifically does it mean basically that there's a prioritization of the local municipality or what does that mean in Massachusetts communities have fairly broad home rule except when it comes to matters that in the Constitution or through legislation are reserved to the state so a good example is municipalities actually have very limited power for taxation beyond what the state allows them to tax, mm -hmm. which is kind of why communities have become very creative with fees. Um, but zoning is one of these matters that is essentially left to the town, cities and towns. Okay. What chapter 40B did was simply, it was an expression of the state kind of stepping in and saying there is this overriding state interest in regional uh, distribution. So if you're not at 10%, then you haven't met your regional fair share. But once you hit that 10%, you're considered to have met your regional fair share. So that's an example of where a state kind of stepped in and said, your zoning's fine, but if you don't allow multifamily housing and you're under 10% affordable, it's not fine. Do you follow that's, what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. That's very helpful. Can, can I ask you, 
can I ask your opinion? What, what's your opinion of for the 40 B? Uh, and, and I, I've seen a lot of 40 Bs in the last few years and I've, I've never participated in one, but I'm, I'm familiar with them. And, uh, it, how active do you think they are in terms of, uh, well, you know, I have mixed feelings. I mean, I do a lot of work with 40 B and I, I guess there's part of me that says, look, most of the multifamily housing we have that, that provides affordability has come about through 40 B. I, I just think that's a fact. So, Mm -hmm. On that point, I'd say it's been very helpful in that regard. I, I think that, uh, unfortunately, the obsession with 10% is something that I see way more in Massachusetts than in my work in other states. So I don't think communities really understand that 10% is about regional need. It becomes this very, oh, well, if I'm at 10%, I've met, I've met the needs in my community and I can stop now. Um, not every town does that, of course. But but for many communities, I think that's just this feeling like, oh my God, we got there and that's that. So in some ways, I think the language around 40B can be more prob problematic than, uh, than, than I would like. Um, but it's hard to say that it's, that it's a bad or destructive law because we really wouldn't have a lot of multifamily housing if it were not for 40B. The reality is that communities have always been able to zone for multifamily housing. They've always been able to, I mean, it was clearly part of, of chapter 808, which was the sort of rewriting of zoning in Massachusetts in 1975, that among the purposes is the provision of housing for low and moderate income people. Yeah, so yeah. the door is open for communities to do that. Yeah, and on that point, Judy, I, I just, you know, it's interesting, you know, I had a conversation about two weeks ago with a, with a planner for a, a town, in this, a nice town in the suburbs of Boston. And she, there was a 60 unit, project uh that the intent is the intent was for it to go as a condo we were looking at it as an apartment complex yep and we i said hey if we were to do additional affordable here could we potentially add you know five units basically is what it was and she said she she said you know that the town she, she she's currently working to educate people in town that that there's a need because they're at 10 percent now apparently that the need is still there. And so um, I'm sure that's something you've seen pretty regularly, but I was, I, 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 yeah, I mean, that's a, a big thing of life, right, in Massachusetts, but it's an interesting situation because I mean, we didn't end up doing the project because we didn't have the ability financially to make it, make it work because we right. couldn't get the additional couple of units, right? So, right. Uh, anyways, but it's uh, just one of those nuances that's just really meaningful in the end, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, I think Anyways, if they were so. actually planning for housing, if they were actually planning for housing, if they were actually planning for inclusion and diversity, then the conversation would be so different. But unfortunately, it's been so yeah. polarized by 40B that it's hard to get people, I'm not blaming 40B, it's just, it just, it is, it does in some ways make the conversation a little bit harder yeah. because yeah. people get the idea that 10% means I've done my job. Absolutely. Hey, there's a question here from uh, Dwight Miriam. Uh, what about as of right ADUs, one or two on most single family lots, like now permitted in Minneapolis, Oregon, and California? What's your opinion on ADUs? Oh, uh, Before, it was a, a accessory dwelling units. Yeah, right? accessory Just dwelling units. Um, yep. You know, this, this is a huge conversation that's been going on on the Cape now for months. And we do have some communities in Massachusetts that have adopted ADUs as of right. Um, what I tend to see is the ADU inside the house is okay. An ADU in a separate structure makes people nervous. And so sometimes that becomes the subject of a special permit, um, but not always. And I think there is an openness now to thinking about ADUs as a fairly innocuous way to provide some, what I will call lowercase affordability in neighbor, at the neighborhood scale. Um, I mean, there's, it's, it, it really should be available. Um, I'm working with a community on the North Shore that's trying to get there and also to have essentially no more single family districts, but to allow two family everywhere. And the conversation wow. goes smoothly until someone goes to the council for a special permit for a small multifamily building and the neighborhood gets upset and the council gets nervous. And, and I just feel like we sort of make three steps forward and two back on this conversation. It's been going on for almost two and a half years now. But as for ADUs, I mean, really, I don't know why the, why the legislature doesn't just blanketly say, this is a protected use, which they've done on some other things. I mean, if you can say churches and, 
and nonprofit organization, you know, uh, educational schools and farms are protected, why can't we just protect ADUs? It would be so much easier. So, so uh, you know, I, I'm familiar with the concept of ADUs, but what, what from a, what if you're on a, I, I don't know, this is, I, mean, I don't want to get too far off topic, but it's an interesting conversation. On topic. If you're, you know, if you have a small lot, is there some relief given to zoning in terms of setbacks and such sometimes, or is it not, not usually, is it always have to conform with zoning or I'm just curious kind of how that looks. I've always seen it as that it had to conform with zoning, but bear in mind most ADU ordinances that exist are, are, are focus on units being inside the dwelling unit. So, oh, okay. and, and there's a limitation on how much, you know, expansion you can allow. So they're, they're really sort of tightly controlled. Where I think that the conversation about the setbacks gets a little bit challenging is when it's the detached structure. Because, um, you know, people get very anxious about having something too close to their boundary line. I've seen ordinances that say, if it's an accessory structure like a garage, you can be closer to the lot line than, yeah. than a house. But now you try to put an apartment upstairs in that garage, and this is a live, real life story, sure. and the next door neighbor says, someone's going to be looking in my bedroom now. So we're privacy freaks. And I think that it really does have, it yeah, makes and there's, and there's, and there's implications for fire departments and whatever else too, right? So it, yeah. it does. And I, I do understand that. But, you know, the building code does help with some of that too. An ADU, we would like, you know, if it's just a family suite, that's one thing. But when it's actually a separate apartment, the different building, basically from a building code point of view, it's, it's a two family dwelling. Yeah. So another, qu another question here. Uh, can you explain the concept of a friendly 40B and what that means for a municipal government? I hate that term. Um, <laughs> so, so friendly 40B in most Thank circles. Linda, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, in most places, friendly 40B is a term that's been attached to a Chapter 40B comprehensive permit that is supported by the town and receives its eligibility to go forward with the Board of Appeals through a blessing from the Department of Housing and Community Development, the state agency that oversees 40B, that it gets sort of its blessing to go forward because the town has supported the project. And it's essentially almost signed off on the application to the state to qualify the project for a comp permit. Most people think of friendly 40B as that. We call it a local initiative program development. Yep. Um, my experience is that there are plenty of friendly 40Bs that come through the more traditional project, which is a developer going to an, organ an agency like Mass Housing or the Mass Housing Partnership and getting their backing without the blessing of the town. But, you know, those can come in and be just as friendly. So it's a term that unfortunately has come to mean only if the selectmen support the project. And, you know, it's kind of too bad. But Oh, there's another one. Uh, this is more Jacinda. Can you explain the concept of the, 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 do you think the COVID may have changed people's mindsets in a way that might allow them to be more willing to vote on local code changes than they would have been previously? Um, so I think I'm guessing that, that the intent there is, you know, is, is there some potential for action here given, given COVID and, and maybe some of the things that are going on in the world today, um, Judy? It's a good question. I think it's premature. I don't know how to answer that. I mean, if anything, what I'm hearing, <laughs> oh Lord, uh, is a little bit of angst out in the suburbs that, well, now because we've had this, people aren't going to want to live in the city anymore. And so we're going to see this uptick in multifamily activity in the suburbs. And what does that mean for us? For us? Um, I've even heard a little anxiety about that from some folks in your world, in the development community. Um, who are concerned about the ability to do some multifamily development in suburban communities close to Boston that are inoculated now from Chapter 40B because they've met the 10%. So it's an interesting time to be having this discussion. I, I just feel like it's premature to know the answer to that. Yeah, absolutely. But it's a great, it's a great topic of discussion. Oh, yeah. I think the, um, yeah. You know, you know, there's a, there's, you know, paying as someone who pays attention to rents, uh, you know, from what, some observations from people in the market are saying the rents are, are steady to rising in the Boston suburbs and they're flat to, to falling in, 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 in town right now. Right. Yeah. So, um, yep. so there's definitely some meaning to that. And, uh, but, and then what you said about the 10%, I mean, that threshold, that's always been a point of kind of conversation around, you know, 
uh, whether or not a town is uh, open to speaking with a development group. You know, right. and I think really work that I've done uh, most recently has been, you know, some people have referred to as friendly 40B, but those, you know, really it's, it's a partnership with the town, you know, working with the town to, to, and their planners and their leadership to figure out, you know, a best, uh, best case to protect from 40Bs, right? So, yep. um, which, um, which can be interesting as well. But I, let's see, the questions from the audience here. Let's see, let's see, a couple of additional questions. Logan, well, can you switch to the, uh, there's another view where we have the speaker view, I think. What are you trying to do, John? Oh, I think we're just going to try and make the speaker view so we can kind of see each other a little bit better. Um, oh, do you want me to do, stop the screen share? Oh, yeah, maybe that's that's what that is. That's okay, all. so those questions will disappear, but I can throw them back at you because I have them. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good, good reference point. And uh, let's see here. Yeah, seeing each other is a little bit difficult when you have that screen share up. Are there are there any specific? I'm just kind of curious. This is a this is a little bit of a general question, but I think it's an interesting one. Are there any municipalities that you're working with that are kind of actively engaging you on the topic in, in terms of trying to move the ball forward on in terms of quality and equity? Um, especially given the, the recent events is there anyone that's really kind of been engaged with you on that judy i'm curious if there's been much progress on that front or in prior to the situation today so you broke up a little bit there can you try to just summarize that again i'm sorry to do that to you oh no of course not <laughs> the question is are there any municipalities that you're working with that are especially progressive or, or forward thinking on some of these land use policies that, that we might want to be aware of and some of the things maybe they've implemented that uh, could be good to be aware of or, or to, to know more about? Well, you know, um, one of, I think one of the great success stories outside the Boston area or the immediate Boston area um, is the town of Littleton, which is a suburb out off 495 and Route 2 just adopted a form-based code for their, for their Littleton Common area, which was pretty brave thing that um, that they took on for a small town, you know. Um, so I think that we do have some communities that are responding in a more progressive way to how to use uh, zoning to to create better places. Um, they're doing some work out there looking at another part of town as well where they've got a train station. But, you know, I, I got to tell you, I think it's really kind of nipping around the edges is my experience. Um, it's, it's one thing to have staff and perhaps an advocacy group or a city or town board or committee that's earnest in trying to, to have a, a, a code that's more equitable. It's another thing when it hits the council or the planning board or the town meeting. Let's not forget that most of our towns are still governed by town meeting. Um, my opinion is that that's really where we have to focus some effort is who are we electing to boards and commissions? Um, who are we electing or appointing to these boards that make fundamental land use decisions? Um, that's where I see, frankly, a lot of weakness. Most of the communities I work in have groups that are trying to do what I would call the right thing, trying to, um, you know, to lead a more, toward, lead their communities toward a more equitable place uh, to provide more opportunity for people to move into their communities. Um, but it hits a wall when it, you know, when you think about what town meeting is, it's, it's this inherently majoritarian institution. And it's inherently confined within those, the borders of that town. So that's, I think, where the real difficulty is. It's when you hit that public forum where the decision gets made. Once the decision's made, to change the zoning once the decision's made to, to not have local preference requirements or whatever it is that's sort of part of the barrier. Um, then you really, then, then the people who are trying to actually, who have to make the decisions, their job gets a lot easier, but it's getting through that electoral level that I think we all have to be working on. Because in my experience, that's really where the difficulty hits. It's getting the policy to change and you need the legislative body Kind of on your side to make that happen. It sounds like it's a, it's almost 
a state level issue, right? In terms oh, of I think leadership. A lot of it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah, you can't I really accomplish, so. you can't accomplish it at the, at the individual town level. No, that hence back to my question about regional planning and, and sort of an enforceable regional policy. I just, yep. I can certainly tell you, I mean, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I, my years in this field, I actually have worked at now in 179 communities in Massachusetts and in different ways. And one thing that absolutely rings true from one place to the next, I don't care whether it's, you know, out in the Berkshires or or one of the inner core communities around Boston is this tremendous sense of we are different. We don't want one size fits all. That's the usual gripe with 40B um, or, or any of the, um, the exclusion, the exemptions under the Zoning Act. You know, we're, we're different. And th so these communities want to be seen as unique and they are and they're precious and in so many ways, but, you know, but they're not that precious. And it's hard to sift. I've said that. Not been fired. But, you know, I, I just think that I won't that's quote you. <laughs> it's, we we have to get serious. I think uh, as at the state level about what we're going to allow communities to to get away with. And until really all 40B says is if you're under 10 percent, some developer like you comes along, then you you're going to have to do something. But that's not saying you have to do something. That's just saying, well, if you're dumb enough to not get to 10% on your own, you're going to get a project you don't like. That is stupid land use policy. Yeah, that's a, that's a hammer over the head land use policy, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, we've got a couple questions here. Let's see. Uh, Bill, how, if at all, does the Fair Housing Act and regulations affect the direct disposition of public property by a public entity that receives federal funds? particularly with ground leases, is there any requirement that an RFP process for residential uses ensure with, uh, uh, comply with fair housing regulations? What about affordable housing laws or policies in Massachusetts? That's a really good question. I mean, mostly what I'm familiar with on the disposition of public, public property is actually governed by procurement laws. Um, and so if you have, as we do in Massachusetts and really other states I've worked in, have some kind of fair housing or anti-discrimination laws that supplement the federal law. Um, you really can't like write into an RFP for land disposition, something that is blatantly discriminatory. I think the issue really becomes, um, you know, thinking about, how, about what opportunities you can create with the land that you do have. So, um, if you have, for example, this is a, this is a really this is a good one because it's real. I'm old enough to remember when in the 1980s school enrollments dropped. Most of you were probably in elementary school at the time, but in the 1980s enrollments dropped for a period, and so a lot of towns closed schools. And then, of course, in the 1990s, the enrollments picked up again. So now we were building more schools. But in the 1980s, when schools closed, when schools were closed because enrollments dropped many communities said, we've got these buildings, let's make senior housing. Interesting. Are you paused? I think you're paused. Oh. I, uh, you were paused. Um, okay. <laughs> my, my internet connection is unstable. Well, um, so I'm just saying that these buildings were made available for, for senior housing. Okay. And nobody was creating housing for families. And yet, when you think about where schools are located, they're often in neighborhoods. So the opportunity was there to try to create, to open the door to some opportunity for, for people of color, for people with low incomes, to have their children near a school, to have their children have access to a school playground, to have, be in a neighborhood. But we made it, we made it senior housing instead. I'm I'm curious about uh, opportunity zones. I, I've spent a lot of time looking at them, Judy. You mentioned them in your, your presentation. Uh, you, you kind of like, mentioned uh, somewhat of a negative light. Uh, I know there has been a few projects that have been, you know, opportunity zone projects that have been meaningful. I, I also know there's a lot of talk and no, not a lot of action because it's, there's a lot of reasons why uh, things aren't happening. But I'm kind of curious quickly kind of what's your, what's your opinion on the opportunity zone concept? I don't know all that much about it because it just it just sort of touches what I do. But I mean, essentially, I have not heard of many projects either. And it just seems as though there are either a lot of requirements or, or things that are just making those projects difficult to do. Beyond yeah. that, I'm not that familiar with it. I just what, what I've been following is what are the areas that are being designated? And and I think then the question is, 
what are communities doing to plan for development in those areas, even if there's no opportunity zone credit per se that comes with it, clearly now we've, towns and cities and towns were asked to nominate the block, the census tracts, right? So right. everybody had a shot here at saying, we wanna make something good happen in this area. Well, now they're designated. And, and maybe there's never really an opportunity zone credit that comes your way, but now what are you gonna to do to plan for the betterment of that area? And many of these communities have access to funds. Put them there. <laughs> it's really okay. that yeah. far. That makes sense. We got a question here. I got a couple more before we, before we wrap. Ann Stevenson, uh, as a county community development staff and a planning city planning commissioner, I would like some suggestions for eliminating our zoning. What is a measurable step the planning commission can make towards a reform like that? That's a very interesting question. Okay, so a little bit of that broke up. The question is to work toward what? What was the change? Uh, elim the elimination of R1, residential one zoning. What's a measurable step that we can uh, take? You mean, so R1, you're, you're meaning single family districts, yes? Yeah. I believe so, yep. Um, well, I'm just thinking about the community I've been working with for a year and a half on the North Shore that's just trying to get to, why can't we have two family homes in these districts? They have. They have several single family districts that are smaller lot to larger lot, but it's all single family. So they're just trying to say, God, what we could open up here if we just said there could be two family homes in these areas. I think that is a conversation probably worth having. I think even the concept, frankly, of ADUs, although ADUs don't solve everything, they move communities toward the conversation of how do you get more housing? Yeah, and you know, I, I don't want to leave anybody with the idea that somehow if you just go do ADUs, your, your life is your life is solved because they can be exclusionary too. I think people have to understand. And if you put yourself in the position of any homeowner who's now saying, "I'm going to put a unit in my house for my mother," well, now she's dead. What am I going to do with this? I'm going to rent it out. I'm going to be really picky about who I put in my house. So I don't think ADUs are a solution to to uh, to, to housing opportunity per se but a two family home changes the conversation. And I think that is something that communities really should be looking at. Mm -hmm. I think often of the Massachusetts zoning law that specifically provides certain protections for single family and two family homes from a change in zoning. And yet most of the towns I work in do not allow two family homes. <laughs> it's just remarkable to me how, how unavailable those units are. So, so the question is more specifically, Judy, is, is there a measurable step with the planning commission that could be taken uh, towards that? Is that, is that, is that getting the, the city planner to introduce that conversation to the commission? Is there something else that could be help move that conversation along? I think is the I point. think doing some case studies on two family housing and, and what opportunities they create, um, how two family homes can be a very, This, some, some initial planning work essentially did i just lose you again it looked like we were freezing, fre uh, freezing up for a minute like you said do some case studies and some initial kind of planning initial outlines planning, i think is helpful to people who are on a board to just have in, to be able to see well what actually has been done and also to be able to see how communities dealt with design issues in the provision of two family homes i, I did some work in a community about 13 or 14 years ago where two family homes were always allowed, but the market wasn't there. And then the market turned and a lot of single family homes were being converted or torn down and replaced with two family homes. And they were having problems with them. Hmm. And so the challenge for the zoning rewrite was just what little things can you try to do here without abolishing two family use to perhaps make this work a little bit better for the, for the single family neighbors around them. Um, so there is this sort of transitional thing that goes on. But I think that have, being able to give planning commissioners some information like here's a community that mo sort of moved toward this. These were things they did in their zoning to make this work. What, who's, who's living in two family homes? You know? Question for you. Um, you mentioned form-based code and I know a lot of the group is kind of familiar with it, but could you maybe just briefly speak about how that that can be a potential solution or, or a game changer for density and, and, and equity? Yeah, 
I mean, it's, you know, again, this sort of goes back to something I said earlier, though, about increasing supply on its own is not a fair housing solution, but certainly form-based code in terms of the predictability that it offers. Um, and that is certainly what sold people in Littleton, tiny little Littleton, now off route too, uh, was the predictability, the ability to say, you know, do I really care what the use is if I can see what, what kind of design standards people are going to have to meet? I think that stuff is very important. And so if, you're, if your game plan is to try to get to fairness through supply, form-based code is a good tool to, for doing that. But, but form-based code doesn't solve the problem of fairness any more than any other zoning change on its own. They don't solve the problem of fairness. You have to get at kind of other things. Um, and I don't mean to pick on local preference, but that's a really good example of those kinds of things have to go if you really want to talk about fair housing. Um, and, and I think to, you know, a, a stronger presence from regional planning, recognizing that fairness is a regional conversation is something we've got to look at uh, here and, you know, other states where communities still think everything ends at the town, town line. Yeah, so just to kind of wrap up, Judy, we, um, we had, a, we had a, a board meeting, the CNU New England board meeting uh, a week ago, and a really great conversation around this topic. And what we're looking at doing is trying to put together a group that can work on this issue to try to make some, some, some progress here. Uh, and so we'd love to have you know, your input on that if you want to participate and anyone else uh, that's interested in participate in that conversation, we, we certainly reach out to us. You can either email me directly, uh, um, John, J-O-H-N, at P-U-G-H-M-G-M-T dot com. You can reach me directly. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in charge of the programming committee, so I can help uh, connect you guys. Uh, but, uh, but again, thank you so much, Judy and uh, Jacinda and everyone for joining us. Um, really interesting conversation. I think there were a lot of really great questions we didn't quite get to. Uh, maybe we'll send those to you, Judy, and have you answer them kind of as a separate thing so we can make sure we can kind of get everyone's ideas and comments addressed. Um, I'd be happy to. If you send me that, you're going to save the chat and then just send it to me and I'll send you back answers. Absolutely. Wonderful. That's fine. That's but, fine. Uh, thanks, everyone, for participating. And we look forward to seeing you again on the 9th with uh, Andrew Consigli on Creative Part Partnerships. All right. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening.